Hi there, welcome to Cambridge House Live. My name is Jonathan Roth. I'm joined now by T Tyler Ballhorn. He is the founder and CEO of Stock Scores. Welcome. Nice to be here. Uh, Stock Scores and Disnat have created a really powerful tool. You guys have created a great partnership going on. Walk me through what you guys have put together. Well, one of the things in the brokerage industry, and Disnat being a broker, they're trying to attract new customers. It's become a case in Canada where everybody's competing on price, and you know, at the end of the day, most prices are the same for that service. So, Disnat wanted to do something to differentiate themselves from other brokers, and they came to me, and we partnered. And what we now offer is my education and my market scanning tools to Disnat clients for free, and that gives their client now a way to have an edge in the market. Um, you know, I've traded for 20 years. I've got some experience that helps you know, other people, and I can share some of that experience with their client base. And that's been a real driving force in their marketing, and um, I think one of the main reasons why they've been able to win the JD Power Award the last few years. So it's been a great partnership for both of us. Now, walk me through. I took a look at what, how the tool works online, and you have a really unique aspect of it is when you're taking a look at a stock or what's going on in the markets, you can have these preset strategies. Right. Walk me through how that works. Well, I'm all about trading on proven numbers. And so my approach to the market is take a set of rules. If you applied them 100 times, they would make you money. You know, I don't know if the next trade's gonna make me money, but I know that if I do this over and over again, I've got a strategy that has what I call a positive expected value. And so I, on the market scan tool, I've built these strategies for people to use so they can select, say, the stock score simple strategy, which would help them find stocks for their RSP, that kind of a, a strategy. And they can run it, and every day they get a list of stocks, and then you apply some other basic analysis techniques and um, use those things to hopefully find good quality stocks and also avoid lousy stocks. Sure. We want to be able to do both. So it's a, it's a real time saver. You, you know, you can analyze the whole market in 10 minutes mm -hmm. with that tool. And so I would assume you can really customize that thing to get exactly what it is you're looking for. Exactly, yeah. We've got yeah. 40 or 50 different filters that you can combine in you know, numerous ways. And you don't have to use my strategies. You can create your own. Um, but either way, it's a, a very powerful tool and time saving tool. Now, I, I saw some quotes online from various people that said this is the world's best stock search engine. Oh, really? Globally. Oh, great. Yeah. Good I to mean, hear you that. got you have a lot of compliments, and obviously yeah. that's why Disney got involved with what you were doing. Yeah, hopefully. You know, I uh, it's funny. I I'm a trader first. I started trading when I was 19 years old at uh, the University of Calgary, and I needed a tool for myself. You know, there wasn't something out there doing that did what I needed it to do, and it was taking me forever to do all this work. So. I built that thing and you know, we've modified it over the years and it just has some unique filters that you won't get anywhere else. The ability to find stocks making statistically significant abnormal gains or abnormal losses, you know, I can't find that anywhere else on the internet. Um, and with one click of a button, you can get a list of those stocks that are moving abnormally, which is often the precursor for a strong trend. So it's a, it's a good tool in that regard. And so obviously the fact that you were a day trader, I mean, that played into totally what you've built here. I mean, in, in essence, it works for a day trader. I assume it works for anybody else. Yeah, you just use the tools in different ways. So sure. I, I like to day trade. I sit in front of my screens all day and do that. Mm -hmm. I'm going to use the tool very differently than most of our, our users who are position traders. People right. managing their money, they go to a job every day, they don't have the time right. to sit in front of a screen. But the tool has the, the flexibility to use it for either type of trading. Right, I got you, okay. Now, what is Stock School Pro? What is that? That's a little bit different. Yeah, well, that's the education. So we have a tool. Yeah. I mean, you, you give a mechanic a wrench, they know how to use it, they can make that tool work. Mm -hmm. With our tools on Stock Scores, if you don't know how to use the tool, it's not going to be as much value to someone who does. And so. Um, probably 10 years ago, I started teaching Canadians how to trade the stock market using my tools, using my methods, and that is really encompassed in the Stock School Pro educational package. When someone opens an account at Disnat, they get the book, they get 75 videos, they get newsletters from me, all these different things to help people learn how to trade the stock market using those tools. I got you, okay. And now Disnat Direct Clients, free access to all of this. That's right, yeah. That's yeah. how it works. You open an account, you get access to the tool, you get the education for free, it's, it's kind of a no-brainer. Now what sets you guys apart in terms of what you've built from other systems that are out there on the market? You know, I've always said that there's a thousand ways to make money in the stock market. Sure. What I've done is develop something that is accessible for the average person. You don't have to have a degree in finance, you don't have to be a Wall Street type person. This is easy things. I can teach someone how to read a stock chart in an hour. And whether I do that face to face with you or whether I do it in a video nowadays because of the internet, it's all out there. Um, it's very simple. It's based on things that I've done over the last 20 years that I've proven. You know, I went from having a $3,000 account to making a lot of money in the stock market doing what I do. And uh, 
and it's you know what I'm doing every day and if, if you take the education you can do that kind of thing as well. So this really started out as a bit of a hobby for you. Like it's, yeah. Walk me through that story because it's quite an interesting one. Well you know I was a student at the University of Calgary and I thought I should learn something about the stock market being a, a business student and so I took a, I played a trading game and did quite well in that and I just got hooked on it. It was kind of my passion and now it's still my passion. I mean, I love, I go on vacation in Hawaii and my wife is, what are you doing? I'm 4.30 in the morning, I'm watching the stock market open. You know, it's something I love to do and right. uh, it's taken me from, you know, pretty humble beginnings, so it's nice. So you've been a day trader for a long time. What's the number one rule that you pass on to anyone who wants to become a day trader or who is, who is doing it? Yeah, I think the number one thing is have good risk management. You can be the best stock picker in the world. Uh, for eight years I was a great stock picker and yet I didn't make a lot of money yet. The key thing is you'd have to realize that you will be wrong sometimes. And in fact, you can be wrong a lot of the time and still do well. When you're wrong, the market tells you you're wrong, you take your loss, you move on. What most people do is because they hate that negative feeling of taking a loss, mm -hmm. is they hang on to their losers. And those losers end up outweighing 10 winners sure. because they get this drag in their portfolio. It eats up their capital, but it also eats up their emotional capital. And it's just depressing to look at your portfolio when you got these losers in there every day. So, Anytime I buy a stock, I know where the exit door is. If the market hits that price, I'm out, I move on to the next one. Right. So, I mean, it's easy to say, but how do you divorce that emotion from the process? Two things. One, you have to be comfortable with the risk you take, and two, you have to have a plan. So, let's talk about risk. Everyone has a tolerance for risk. Someone just starting out may have zero tolerance for risk, in which case you should be paper trading the market just to see if you know what you're doing. Once you start trading, say, okay, I'm willing to lose $100 on a trade and let that guide your position size. Don't buy how much stock you can afford to buy, but base the size of your position on how much you can afford to lose. Right. If you can sleep well on the loss, then you're more likely to take the loss when the market tells you to. The second thing is to have a written plan. It doesn't have to be very long, one or two pages. This is what I'm gonna buy, this is what I'm gonna sell, this is how I'm gonna manage risk, and this is how I'm gonna manage my emotions. Those four things, we call those the four pillars. Put those things in a written plan, and you'll be much more likely to follow it. So, I have uh, done a little bit of research and I found out that, you, I mean, you literally don't even read the business section of the newspaper. So knowing that, how, how do you, like, pure, this is purely based on your technical analysis in terms of when you buy stock. You don't care about anything, the headlines, anything, it just does not matter to you. Right. I, and I, I don't con consider myself a real technical analyst either. I don't yeah. use common indicators like stochastics, MACD. I think a lot of that stuff, you get lost in it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm all about trading on inside information. I don't get inside information, so I have to let the market tell me when there's something going on. And when stocks start to behave abnormally, it's telling us that there's significant fundamental change there. What I read about in the newspaper or on TV, that's already priced in. It has no value. It's interesting. It might make me fall in love with the company, which I don't really want to do, um, but I don't want to know that stuff because there's no value in it. I want to know what the market is going to be trading on a week from now, a month from now. Within every company, there's always someone that has that information and they're gonna act on it in the market and create the abnormal activity that our computer systems will track. So you have you have said that 90% of traders will not be successful. Yeah. Obviously you have been. Yeah. What's been your advantage? Well, one of the reasons 90% of traders aren't successful is because there's no barrier to entry into trading. If you wanna be a doctor, you go to school for a long time to become a doctor. Mm -hmm. You wanna be a trader, open an account, you're a trader. And I think people underestimate how hard it is to make money in the market. It's simple, but it's not easy. The rules are simple. My rules, I could write them down on one piece of paper, and, and, but you would still probably lose with those rules because you haven't learned how to apply them, you haven't taken the time to practice, you haven't taken the time to manage your emotions, all of those things. And so you have to be prepared to give yourself some time to learn before you risk money in the market. You know, I built a trading simulator as a place where people can practice trading before they risk a penny in the market. And if you can't make money on, in a computer game, then you shouldn't be doing it for real either. So we're here at the Cambridge House show, and these are all junior mining companies that are here. You must dabble with those stocks from time to time. I do, yeah. Where do you think the juniors, where do you think the market's going right well, now? Well, that market has been terrible yeah. uh, since, really since Ben Bernanke kind of hinted that there wouldn't be QE3. That yeah. was uh, back in early February, I believe. So that market's been in a real slide, but what we've seen in the last two weeks is the mining stock sector has been the top performing sector in the market over the last two weeks. And the reason why is because we're starting to get a sense that the U.S. economy is slowing down. We already know that Europe is slowing down. And so now that buzz about maybe there's quantitative easing three coming down the tube 
that's going to help gold prices, that's going to help silver prices because of course devaluation of currency, people put their money in there. And so we're starting to see people pick at those stocks again. So I'm, I'm optimistic that that downward trend that has been underway for the first quarter for the most part is, is nearly over. Um, I think it's still early in the reversal, but I'm seeing a lot of good signs in that sector and I'm actually getting interested in it again. Really? So you're yeah. really optimistic? I mean, to I a certain am. extent, this is yeah. a good buying time but right you know, now. If you'd asked me two weeks ago, I would have said, don't touch these things. Sure. So sure. It, that's the thing, the market tells you when it's time. Right. You can't try to be smart and right. say, well, this company's got great fundamentals. Well, if the market doesn't care, right. it's not going anywhere. What right. we're seeing now, though, is the market's starting to care again and the money's starting to come back there and it's leaving technology and that kind of thing. So, so to what extent, I know you don't read the business section of the newspaper, but you probably read the front page from time to time. In terms of what's going on in Europe and even to a lesser degree, the United States, Asia and stuff, to what degree do you think those situations are going to influence what's going on with the juniors? It, this is a good news, I would expect. Yeah, it's such think. a wild card. You know, if, if the economy is picking up, and improving, that's actually bad for these juniors because right. that means these um, hedges against currency devaluation aren't going to work so well. With that said, if China improves, then base metals are going to do well. And so there's two different camps and you have to understand whether the market is liking the juniors because of risk or because of an improving economy. And there are two different ways that you're going to trade them. Um, I think that the better potential, you know, the big bull run that we saw in mining stocks in the last five years was because of currency devaluation. And so if the U.S. economy is slowing down, that's going to help those stocks more than anything. Right. Okay, final question for you. Mm -hmm. I know you dreamed of being a race car driver when you were a kid. Yeah. Do you race any cars now? I, I do a little bit, yeah. yeah. I, uh, I've been known to get behind the wheel of a race car and do some laps. Yeah. Not as much as I'd like, but uh, it's certainly but it, one of my enough, passions. Enough. Yeah, do it on the track, not on the road. But okay, um, yeah, lots of fun. Okay. Well, listen, appreciate your time, appreciate you joining us today, and good luck, a great partnership with you and Disney. Great, thank you.